most folks think of Ferraris as eight or 12 cylinder cars. The four cylinder Ferrari is kind of strange to most people. They also don't realize that the first two world Formula One championships were won with four cylinder cars. These cars are unique. There are so few, There's, you know, there are three left with the right motors. To be able to go out and use it the way it was designed is very rewarding. I'm Robert Avery Phillips. I am a retired Navy Supply Corps Admiral from the United States Navy. My car is a 1955 Ferrari 500 Mondial Series 2 Scagliati Body Spider. Most of the 500 Mondials in 1955 were raced by privateers. Ferrari sold these cars to, to various customers who would go out and race. The Mondial name came from the fact that Ascari won the world championships, the Mondiale. So the Mondial was just an aberration for that. So his four-cylinder cars were called Mondials from that world championship time. Enzo Ferrari received a letter from President Trujillo of Venezuela looking to place Venezuela on the world sports car map. So my car then was the first car to come to this hemisphere. It was driven by Harry Shell and Eugenio Castellotti. First in class, I think about fifth overall at the first Grand Prix of Venezuela. The car was immediately sold to Porfirio Rubirosa. The race at Sebring was a, another very good race for the car. It finished 10th overall, uh, being co-driven by Jim Pauley and Rubirosa, taking a first in class this was the first time a Series 2 500 Mondial had been brought into the United States. So in its first U.S. appearance, it did very well. After Sebring, it was sold to a Cincinnatian, one of the World War II pilots who survived and then decided racing Ferraris was fun, so they would go out and buy Ferraris and race each other. At Nassau in 56, Lundgren spun and was hit by a wacky Arnold, of course. It then sat in Cincinnati for about two years, and finally a USAC driver by the name of Robert Reddy Davis bought the car. In the fall of 59, the differential seized, so he puts this car on an open trailer in the middle of the winter and drives it to California. And so he has it stored in the back corner of a Rambler dealership in downtown Richmond. I heard about the car, went up and looked at it. I was about to walk away when I said, well, I wonder what motor they put in this, Devon. And I bent down, picked up a rag, wiped the valve cover, and it, Ferrari, <gasps> I've got to save it. I bought the car in June of 1960 for a grand total of $2,225, two thirds of my year's salary. Today we kind of shake our heads, but that was a lot of money in 1960. I could have bought two and a half MGAs. But it's only a machine. I should be able to take it apart, figure out what's broken, fix that, and put it back together. The car is a different animal on the track than it is on the street. It's a five-speed crash transmission. There is no synchromission there. You need to synchronize your gears going up and coming down. You double clutch to do that on the way down. On the street, it is much more difficult to drive. Learning the time lag that you need to allow before you put it into the next gear when you're on the street is so totally different than when you're on the track. On the track, you're taking it up to high revs and it seems like the car is so happy. It's in its environment. You do your shifting, it seems to snick into gear so nicely. Downshifts are so much more perfect. On the street, you feel a lot of grinding and crunching. I've never learned to do it on the street as well as it does on the track. It's an animal that is very much in its own element out there where it was built to be a race car. And that's where it loves me. In high school, I took four years of woodworking. And the first entire year 
My hard-nosed instructor only allowed us to use one power tool, and that was the grinder, to sharpen our chisels and plane blades. We had to learn to plane an exact 45-degree bevel on a piece of wood. We had to learn to plane two flat pieces so that when you glued them together, they were perfect. And I think that experience taught me that you can do practically anything you put your mind to with your own hands. Going through and overhauling this the son of a 1954 Formula One motor to the point where it runs as happily as it does today gives me a great sense of satisfaction. Frankly, when you put the last cover on it and you can't see all the beautiful innards, it's almost a disappointment. But to see the result and have it get up and go like it goes, if you call that a redeeming value, I think that's probably as close as I can come to describing it. about the 15 minutes of fame because of the internet. You Google it and it shows all these different pictures and all this kind of thing. I don't think it's changed the relationship with me and the car. My wife has put up with it for 53 years. That hasn't changed there. God bless her. She puts up with getting up at 4.30 in the morning so we get to the track in time to have our first run. Every time I go out to the track, even though my memory is still good, my wife tells me, remember, you and the car are both senior citizens. You don't have anything left to prove. Take it easy. <laughs> The nine months it took us to put it together resulted in my mom calling it her first grandchild. My son has referred to it as his elder sibling. It's a family piece. It's somewhat startling when you see some of the prices that some similar kinds of cars go for, but it doesn't sit in a glass canister someplace for people just to stare at. I enjoy driving it. I'm a temporary custodian. Somebody else someday is going to have that car. I hope they get and develop the same feel towards it. My fear is it's going to go someplace and end up in a museum. That would be a terrible fate, in my view. The value of the car aside, it likes being driven. It needs to be driven. It was born to be driven.